started. Amen. Tonight we'll be moving on to chapter two, um, where we'll be looking at some additional things involving David. Um, we recognize that in the book of First Samuel that David had been anointed to be king of Israel. And it looked like at this time, it is time for him to walk into the position that he was anointed in back in um, 1 Samuel. But we'll find out that sometimes even at the time when we should be issued in, into our greatest times of victory, sometimes we are still hindered with obstacles. We understand that after David was anointed to be king that he ran into many obstructions that, that Saul the king was attempting to kill him in many occasions. We remember that when he had left his home um, and, um, and while he was gone, the Amalekites had come and spoiled and, and captured his wives and children and all the men that were with him, his wives and children. And we remember that David had to encourage himself in the Lord. And we'll find that now that even after the death of Saul, when it should be David's opportunity to rise up and take power and begin to walk in the anointing that God has given him, um, he still is going to face opposition. And I think what we can glean from this second chapter of 2 Samuel is the fact that if we could learn to persevere through um, issues and circumstances and maintain our focus, then we would be able to see, succeed many ways like David did. And I think when we keep consider that the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart, I believe that one of the attributes we'll find is that David wasn't easily discouraged and David wasn't easily because he had a, such a relationship with God that whatever he went through, he knew how to be a worshiper. He knew how to go back to God and get through situations. What we're going to find in chapter 2 is now that Saul is dead, we would expect that the children of Israel would look to David to be the once and coming king, but we're going to find that David is going to face such opposition that it almost created a war. In fact, there will be um, examples of civil war that will have broken out between the children of Israel and the children of Judah because of the fact that David is now in position to um, succeed Saul as the king of Israel. So let's begin at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, unto Hebron. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there were, and there they, the men of Judah, anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they buried, were they that buried Saul. So now the tribe of Judah by themselves have now anointed David to be king over them. Now they're going to have to go and present David to the other 11 representative tribes Represented and asked them to also um, anoint David as king and captain over the entire country of Israel. David sent messages unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, verse 5, and said to them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that you have shewed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I will also requite you of this kindness, because you have done this thing. 
And for those that may have missed it, what happened was after Saul had been killed by the Philist or had been wounded, sorely wounded in the battle against the Philistines, he, was, he fell upon his own sword so he wouldn't be tortured by the Philistines. But the Philistines did take his body and beheaded him and hung his body in one of their temples. And the men of Jabesh Gilead snuck in um, like a special forces unit and retrieved the body of Saul and brought it back into Israel so that it could be buried. And David is recognizing these men because they did not allow the Philistines to um, show off or to um, bask in the victory over Saul and defile his body. So he brought his body back and his bones were buried under a tree. So he's now recognizing and letting them know that he is going to be a blessing to these men because of the kindness that they showed unto Saul even after Saul's demise. And in verse 7 it says, Therefore let your hands be strengthened and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. So he's letting them know that Judah has already chosen me, and um, I'm giving you an opportunity to follow likewise. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. Now we understand that at this point, all of Saul's sons have not been slaughtered. Ishbosheth has survived. But we understand that the word that was given to Saul by Samuel the prophet was that his line was going to end and that he would not rule, he or his seed would rule over the kingdom of Israel. God took his kingdom away because of disobedience. And we, we, we can go back. It was because the Bible says that disobedience is as witchcraft, rebellion. So we understand, and he, um, it said that um, Samuel tore his robe and said, the way that I have torn this robe is the way that the kingdom has been ripped from you and your descendants forever. So Abner, the son of Ner, is trying to go against the prophetic word of God. And, we will, and, and one of the things that we can be blessed of as believers is whatever God has spoken over us, the enemy can't do anything about us. He can try to hinder us. He can try to distract us, but he cannot undo the word. And I'm not talking about just an individual prophetic word that someone may have spoken into your life. I'm speaking of this Bible that when you get this word in you and get to know who you are in God, that you're above only and not beneath, that you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field, that you're blessed coming and you're blessed going. When you begin to put that word in you and to know that, you know, that you have no need to fear, that, that you are victorious in all these things, we are more than conquerors. When you allow that prophetic word to get in you, there's nothing that the enemy can do to undo the prophetic word of God in your life. So here is Abner, the son of Ner, trying to undo the prophetic word in Saul's life by taking his son and made him king over Gilead, verse 9, and over Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years, six months. And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zeruriah and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, the one on one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, 
Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Now, what it meant was play before us. They said, let them compete. Um, if you, those that like movies, if you've seen karate movies where they have two, because um, these were the men of Abner. Abner was the captain of Saul's guard and Joab was the captain of David's guard. And you have to understand that they were probably surrounded by what would be um, high level forces, highly trained, highly um, skilled Soldiers, they you know they weren't your grunt infantry. These were special forces. These were your Navy SEALs, your Delta Force type individuals that were at this level that would be around the captain of the guard for the king. So they are on each side of the pool, and they have decided together to watch their special forces, highly skilled soldiers, compete with one another. So they arose and went over by the number 12 of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And they caught everyone his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together, wherefore that place was called Helkath-Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And that really means... Literally, the field of sharp swords. Hell hath hath zurim, the field of sharp swords. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. In other words, David's special forces were a lot stronger and more skillful than what, saw, what Abner's forces were able to do and they actually slaughtered them. Now there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel, and Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. This boy could run. He, he, was, he was fast. He was um, and like a wild roe, like a deer. He, he, he could he could, he, or, or Roe was, was another name for gazelle, so he was fast like a gazelle. And Asahel pursued after Abner, and in going he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. So Abner is now trying to flee from Asahel, but Asahel is on him, and wherever he would not turn, and can you imagine somebody chasing you down to, to do violent harm to you, and you can't shake him? And that's what it's saying, that um, Abner was unable to shake him. Now, why was he tracking Abner down? I believe the reason that he was tracking Abner down is because Abner tried to undo the prophetic word on Saul's kingdom. God had ended it. It's over for you. You failed me, and I'm not going to pass your kingdom down through generations of your lineage, Saul. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to David. And we all know that, so it's time for this to take place. But Abner, see, what would have happened is Abner would have lost his position. See, sometimes folks will hold on to an old dead regime, an old dead situation, an old dead circumstance because they don't want to lose their position. And Abner didn't want to release. He was the captain of the guard. He would have had to come and submit. If he submitted to David, he wouldn't be the first in command because he would have to submit and probably be under Joab because they, he is from a defeated army. The, the, the armies of Israel had already fallen, so the best thing for them to do would be to submit to David's authority, but he would have lost his position. And in order to keep to maintain his position, he raises up um, Ishbosheth, who was not anointed to be king. So here is Asahel chasing down Abner. And, Abner's, and Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, Yes, I am. 
He said, and Abner said to him, turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left and lay hold on one of the young men and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. In other words, he's saying, you know, go after one of these other young men, but let me be. But Asahel said, no, I'm on you. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my faith to Joab thy brother? In other words, he was saying, nah, I'm trying to do you a favor. Because I'm a bad dude. You might be fast like a gazelle, but if you really corner me, I'm going to defend myself. Then I'm going to have to face your brother and explain how I put you down. So he is trying, he thinks he is trying to assist Asahel. Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner with the hinder end of his spear smote him under the fifth rib that the spear came out behind him and he fell down there. Abner didn't turn around to face him. He just basically took his spear and because um, I believe Asahel's pursuit was he was so focused on capturing Abner that he did not, he was not, he had lost consciousness of his defenses. You know, and sometimes you can be so focused on your, 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 um, your target that you don't stand back. You know what they say, you can't see the forest for the trees. So he was so focused on Abner, he did not consider that Abner could smite him with the hinder. In other words, he smote him with the blunt end of his spear. That it went out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell and died stood still. Bam, the whole thing is shut down. And Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of a hill. Now, if you remember, Saul was the captain of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. So now Abner has come to a place where all of the Benjamites have gathered with him and now they're going to take a stand against the forces of David. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou hot bid the people return from following their brethren. And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still, and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought them any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain, passed over Jordan, and went to Bethron, and they were in Mahinium. And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servant 19 men and Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin 300 and threescore men died. So David lost 19 men and Asahel. So he lost 20 men. Abner's servants lost 360 men. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in ben Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at the break of day. So we can see that the forces are now starting to position themselves in such a way as to determine who will be the true leader of Israel. Um, Abner has aligned himself with Ishbosheth, 
and is seeking to put Ishbosheth on the throne of Saul and um, Joab and his brothers are attempting to maintain and to assist in David being um, put on the throne. And this is the beginning of a turf battle or a civil war, a insurgency that they are going to use military tactics in order to solidify the kingdom either under David or under Ishbosheth. So as we go through history now, we are finding that David is now in position where he should be the king over all of Israel. What, you would, what we would learn if we, if we go back and look is that at this time, Judah had become the greatest tribe in Israel and had outnumbered even the other ten tribes. Um, Benjamin had become the smallest tribe. If we look back at the end of the book of Judges, we found that um, the, most of Israel had turned on um, Benjamin due to the sin that was committed with the Levites' concubine, and the tribe of Benjamin had shrunk to be the smallest of the tribes, which is why it was interesting that God pulled Saul out of the tribe of Benjamin, and that's why he was saying, I'm the least of the least tribe. I'm the, I'm the, you know, my family is poor and destitute, and we're from the poorest and destitute tribe. Why would you choose me to be captain over your people? And, and I think it was a representation that God can take anybody from any circumstance and raise them up if it is his will and desire. So at that point, at this point now, we see that there's now conflict between the two parties um, on who is going to be the rightful ruler of Israel. Amen. I'm going to open it up for questions or comments. <laughs> 